So uh, let me welcome uh, everyone who's here, the participants in the panel and all the, um, the audience as they're starting to filter in. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists very briefly. I will, after a few minutes, be posting a bio into the chat so that you can see the longer bios and the, the, the pretty pictures that everybody sent in. Um, but uh, this is really a great opportunity for, uh, and, and Valerio, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's actually four of us who are um, authors on this topic. You have a book on the way also, but you have kindly uh, stepped into the commentator function here. Um, but let me start with Ifeoma Junwa, who is um, the author of a book coming later this year or 2022, Ifeoma? You're muted. Yes, uh, most likely 2022. Okay, great. Um, she recently joined the University of North Carolina uh, School of Law. Um, as an associate professor with tenure, and uh, she has been writing on these uh, subjects of AI and decision-making at work for a long time. Uh, Valerio De Stefano, our commentator, is the BOFZAP -B professor of labor law at the Faculty of Law at the University of Leuven, but he just told us that he's in the process of moving to Osgood Hall um, just outside Toronto, and so he'll be a North American soon. Um, I am the author of a, the book that is soonest to come out of the, of the books uh, on tap. It's called Automation Anxiety, Why and How to Save Work. Um, I'm the Catherine law Rain Professor of Law at NYU. Um, and Brishan Rogers is the author of Data and Democracy at Work, which um, Brishan will be coming out when? Yeah, fall of 2022, yeah. unfortunately, ooh, so it's ooh, a long schedule. Ooh, okay, yeah. it is a long yeah. schedule, but okay. So the three of us came together around this um, uh, very active uh, topic of technology and the future of work. Um, I, if, if in case um, Wilma is still uh, listening, uh, we taught a uh, seminar, we have taught a seminar called Regulating Work Beyond Employment and the Future of Work. Literally every day there was a new conference or a new website on the future of work. And a lot of it, uh, not surprisingly, revolves around technology. Um, so uh, I gave myself the opening spot because I'm a little bit worried about my, inter my internet in case we have the threatened uh, lightning storm that might be coming through here. Um, and so uh, I will say most uh, legal scholarship and technology and the future of work, uh, including the two other uh, books that are featured here, and I believe uh, including Valerio's book as well, is not about how much work um, is going to uh, be left uh, in the wake of technological change, but about what kind of work, how, it's, um, how workers are hired and fired and managed. That is all extremely important and probably more accessible and tractable by legal scholars. I think legal scholars have a lot to say about that. By contrast, the prospect of automation and of um, an economy with less work is actually largely neglected by legal scholars. And that's despite its being um, pretty tightly intertwined with concerns about fishering and the gig economy, about which we'd have to say our field is borderline obsessed. Um, so that's my topic. It's the prospect of a more automated future of less work. Uh, I wanna start by recognizing that this prospect is often overhyped. Um, it is still hotly debated and it is neither certain nor imminent. Um, mine is not a book in the robo-apocalypse um, genre. Um, still, um, my pretty deep dive into the economic literature on automation and its impact um, on jobs, especially uh, artificial intelligence, um, to which I devote an early chapter of the book, uh, has led me to believe that over the next few decades, we are likely to see a gradual technological encroachment on the comparative advantages of human labor in a wide swath of jobs. Now, it's possible that that um, decline in demand for labor um, coincides with a gradual secular decline in labor supply, though so far that's been um, much less pronounced in the US than in um, uh, much of the developed world. Whatever you know happens on that score, there will still be cyclical ups and downs, and we're seeing one of the ups now in demand for labor. 
Um, and we might have another cataclysmic shock or two to labor market demand, um, as we've seen a couple of in the last uh, two decades. Uh, and the downturns, large or small, will probably spur automation as they always have in the past. Uh, but underneath those ups and downs, um, there's good reason to believe that we're going to see a gradual erosion in demand for what I'm calling here. Um, and I hope this is an acceptable um, uh, ordinary human labor, meaning uh, things that humans can still do better than machines, but that plenty of humans can do, for which a large number of humans will be competing. Um, so the working premise for the book is that we are probably facing a future of less work um, over the next few decades, at least less work for those without specialized human skills and advanced education, and possibly less work overall. Um, but I want to um, take a more sort of upbeat approach to this topic. There is good news here, and it comes in a few different parts. So first, um, in, in thinking about what we should be aiming for as a society, there is a big potential upside, historically very prominent in discussions of automation, to um, declining demand for labor in the form of more time for the rest of life, better work-life balance for both individuals and for the society as a whole, if we can put in place smart and humane social arrangements to deal with it. Uh, and so a key point in the book is that um, we can't give up on work. We can't just let some people get pushed out of the labor market. Um, widespread engagement in shared work has underappreciated social and political virtues that cannot be replaced by guaranteed income. Um, virtues that are entirely apart from the income and uh, economic security that it produces for um, many people. But on the other hand, we should not necessarily be striving to maintain our current norms of full-time full employment. Um, if indeed we are facing a future of less work. Um, rather, we should be aiming for a future of decent work, though less of it, for nearly everyone, um, and that's an achievable goal. If we don't take seriously the prospect of declining demand for ordinary labor, the risk is that we end up with a future of little or no decent work or shards of precarious low wage work for many workers who get shoved out to the bottom of the, uh, the real, uh, the, the reasonably decent labor market, along with even longer hours and higher wages for those with scarce skills. Um, in other words, uh, we could be looking at an even more polarized and dysfunctional labor market than we've seen, and an even more fractious and divided polity than we've had in recent years. So that's, um, I'll say, that's the first big piece of good news. We, we could be uh, aiming for a better future in which people have more time for the rest of life. The second piece of good news is about how to get there. Um, there is a suite of policy responses to a foreseeable future of less work that will bring big gains for workers and their families and the society, whether or not this forecast of gradual net job destruction is actually borne out. In other words, we don't have to wait for a consensus on what's gonna happen on that score. So for example, it makes sense to, um, socialize many of the entitlements that are now attached to employment, but that don't have to be. In other words, what I call to unburden employment as much as politically possible. And there are some limits to that, and I discussed that in the book. So health insurance is the best example of a crucial entitlement that is pretty costly and is largely delivered and funded through employment and payrolls. Putting the cost there, um, as opposed to a wider tax base, serves no good policy ends. Um, in fact, it overtaxes the use of human labor relative to the use of capital, and it encourages various kinds of fissuring. Uh, less should turn both for employers and for workers on the line between formal employment and independent contracting. Less in terms of cost and less in terms of uh, economic security. Socializing both access to health insurance and its costs beyond employment would modestly reduce employers' incentive to replace human labor with machines, um, as well as their incentive to replace full-time employees with part-time or contingent workers or independent contractors. Um, it would help to furnish a decent foundation for those workers who end up outside of what I call the fortress of employment um, in platform or other sorts of gig work or freelancing. And it would liberate some workers who would 
might actually prefer that independent mode of work. It would liberate them to make that choice without sacrificing basic economic security for themselves and their families. And if we fund those entitlements um, largely through revenue sources that are more progressive than the payroll tax, uh, we can also achieve some much needed economic redistribution. A second big set of proposals aims to spread work. Um, in other words, to shift work from those who manifestly have too much of it um, to those with too little um, and to create decent jobs out of splinter just-in-time work that is the bane of many workers' existence um, and to aim toward a better societal and individual work-life balance. I say, and, and this is very tricky partly because some of those who have too much work are very well paid for those extra hours and um, might be choosing to work those longer hours. But work spreading is um, an absolutely critical part of the strategy for maximizing the gains and, and, and mitigating the losses from a more automated econ economy. And it's a far better response to a potential future of less work than simply substituting guaranteed income for work-based income. Um, there are a lot of strategies of work spreading. Like I said, it's tricky and I work these out it's specifically in the US context because it, it sort of helps to have a particular uh, starting point and framework in mind. Um, so uh, start with guaranteed access to more paid leaves and vacations, which America is absolutely terrible on. We're known as no vacation nation. Um, to Yes. Just, uh, you asked me to keep time for you and we're at time, but go, okay. obviously go ahead. All right, and I'm almost done. Yeah. Uh, fierce, so shorter hours and longer e leaves for those who want them. There are scheduling laws to help reassemble just-in-time work into real jobs and expanded overtime coverage and eventually a shorter standard work week. So the key point here, and this is where I'm gonna close, nearly every single one of the policies proposed here, as well as the strategies for unburdening employment, makes sense here and now, they would serve economic justice and, the, and a whole range of individual and societal interests independent of the potential uh, of a future of less work. So thanks very much. Um, and I'll turn things over to Ifioma. Uh, thank you so much, Cindy. Uh, and I just wanted to say uh, thank you for inviting me uh, for this uh, panel. And also thank you to all the participants here uh, to listen to us. Uh, so my book uh, is squarely focused on the traditional workplace. So I'll have some of the, uh, I, I guess, some of the same caveats that um, Cindy had in the beginning, um, which is to say that um, while the focus of Cindy and Rishan's work is on the larger political economy of work, uh, my book is more preoccupied with the experience of work for the traditional worker. And I use traditional worker in the sense to distinguish between um, more established industries versus the gig economy, which is a newer uh, you know, evolution of work. So I'll start by saying that the, the information revolution has ushered in a data-driven reorganization of the workplace where big data and the machine learning algorithms that can run them are deployed to make meaning out of a mountain of minutia of workers' actions and behaviors. With this book then, I argue that given recent technological developments such as the mass collection of data, dubbed big data, and the computerized algorithms um, that may perform rapid analyses uh, on that data while also creating de novo models for analysis, machine learning algorithms, the characteristics, skills and outputs of the contemporary worker has become quantified in a manner and to a degree previously unseen in history. This quantification in turn is changing the very nature of work. Uh, it's blurring boundaries between work and non-work and it's raising new legal questions about employee privacy, uh, worker power and autonomy and also the limits of employer control over the worker. Now, it is a given that new technology is constituted. That is, new technology changes the way we view the world, and in fact, can constitute the world and social relations anew. But it is often overlooked that technology and ideology are co-constituted. That is, technology only exists insofar as it is conceived as part of an ideology and is used in service of the same. Thus, technology is never neutral 
It's embedded, uh, embedded in both its design and use cases are theories of what is and what ought to be. Uh, so this book essentially is arguing that technology is both made available and also shaped by extant legal frameworks. Co-constitutively, new legal frameworks are also prompted by new technology cases. Thus, the focus of the book is on how the law has met or failed to meet the changing realities of work uh, foisted on workers by technology. It is also important for me to note here that the focus of the book is on traditional workplaces, right? Not the gig economy. My feeling is that the, that the rise of the, of the gig economy and the great leap of technology at, a technological advancement that made that gig work possible um, has necessitated a lot of academic examination. And that in turn, this has often also meant that workers in traditional workplaces have been neglected in terms of their experience with technology. Um, I also think the same could be said for the focus on automation. I think while rightfully, the automation of jobs and the job loss that could come with it should be a matter of grave concern. Uh, my book is more preoccupied with the plight of workers who may not face the risk of total automation of labor, but who may face continued automation of management, what I term mechanical managers, who more efficiently enact Taylor's principles. Another note on the framing and purpose of the book. Much like the Luddite's action of breaking looms to protest a particular use of technology to reimagine re work in ways that were deleterious to the uh, social relationships and they were labeled anti-technology, um, this book is not anti-technology. Uh, those who seek to critique new work technologies uh, as significantly altering the employment bargain uh, for worse are often uh, saddled with the label, label of Luddite. This book, however, is mostly agnostic about the efficacy of emerging technologies. The review of technology offered in the book is primarily for the purpose of illustrating how such technologies may defy current law and legal ideals. As Kaplinsky notes, neoluddism, the response drawn by many whose jobs are being destroyed by technology's diffusion is not just futile, it seriously misspecifies the analysis. The problem lies not with the technology, but in a form of social organization, which misuses its potential to produce frighteningly destructive weapons, inappropriate products, and undesirable work processes. Also, as uh, Keith Grinth and Steve Wooger make clear in their seminal work on technology, the machine at work, the Luddites were not really anti-technology. Rather, they were actively protesting against a social reorganization of work that would devalue their artisanal skill and threaten their livelihood. So if you look at a, a symbolic perspective of, of Luddism, right, then the machine is merely a metaphor for a cultural revolution that the Luddites were more or less recognized, uh, had more or less recognized as inherent, inherently destructive to all that they held dear. The pre-industrial moral economy was about to be ripped apart by laser fair capitalism. Uh, Hammond and Hammond writing in 1949 also concluded the same. They found the Luddites to be not so much against machinery as against the power of the machinery. The real conflict of the time was the struggle of various classes, some working in factories, some working in their homes to maintain a standard of life. Thus, my book, The Quantified Worker, is a critique of the present application of work technologies. The book argues, especially, for the application of law, even to emerging technologies. The book is pro-regulation of work technologies 
as a necessary bulwark against not just the potential for a similar type of Luddite result, uh, revolt, but also against the erosion of the quality of life of all workers. Um, I add here also that allegations of Luddism when critiquing uh, work technologies uh, is an evasive rhetoric and is deployed in service of anti-regulation. The work of the legal scholar Julie Cohen especially has illuminated this socio-political phenomenon. She notes, in regulatory proceedings and in the popular press, the information processing industries have worked to maintain, to position privacy and innovation as intractic, intractably opposed. That strategy has produced a discursive process that infuses innovation with a particular contingent meaning linked to economic and expressive liberty. The discourse of information processing as autonomous innovation signals an important shift in the political economy of surveillance, for example. Um, it is basically the emergence of what uh, Professor Cohen, Cohen has termed the surveillance innovation complex. In discussing emerging work technologies and how to corral them under the rule of law, I examine various technologies in the book. And most of these technologies I term mechanical managers for their potentiality and capability to basically automate management. Ifioma, now yeah. it's my turn to interrupt and ask you to sort of wind it up. Great, great. I'm, I'm close, You're right. Okay. So, so I look at automated hiring systems, wearable tech, productivity applications, and genetic testing. For me, wearable technology as a form of mechanical manager represents the highest potential and opportunity for quantifying the worker. And more importantly, they also raise new legal questions about data ownership, data control, and ultimately how data may be used to manage the worker. So thank you very much. And I look forward to questions. Okay, thanks. Rishan, take it away. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, great. Okay, uh, so thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm really excited for this panel. Um, I'll be talking about a book that I am hoping to wrap up this summer. And so comments on any level are really welcome. And I'd be happy to send the manuscripts around as well. Um, the, and it overlaps quite a bit with both Cindy and uh, Ifioma's analyses. I'd say the book has two overall goals. Um, the first is to move debates around technology, work, and law uh, away from a focus on automation and the app-based gig economy, um, as has already been mentioned, both of which are very important, but have probably taken up, you know, I think a little too much space in public debate. Um, and the second, and this is kind of more ambitious in some ways, uh, and sort of more of the, the central goal of the book, is to put debates on technology, law, and work on a different theoretical footing. So I want to move away from technological determinism. I want to move away from kind of, you know, market fundamentalism or neoliberalism and develop a theory that better accounts for the constitutive role of law and social relations. Uh, and that includes, importantly here, class relations and therefore capitalist development processes. So to do so, the book draws from various bodies of scholarship that shed light on that set of questions including legal realism, social studies of technology, heterodox economics, and political economy. Um, let me summarize the, the two arguments in turn. So on the first, uh, regarding how I see technological change altering work uh, at an empirical level, uh, I, I join other tech scholars, including Julie Cohen, including Ifioma, uh, and arguing that modern AI is really a means of statistically analyzing massive data sets data sets and then applying the insights that are gleaned at a population wide level to make predictions about human behavior. Modern AI therefore replicates some human judgments but typically does so imperfectly and yet close enough to be usable in production, especially in large enterprises. The limits of AI though also limit the scope of the automation threat in ways I'm happy to discuss in the Q&A. 
For the foreseeable future, I think the more important trends will be the use of data and algorithms to reshape management and production processes, or what others have called, uh, and I borrow the term, algorithmic management. So for example, today, uh, companies can use massive amounts of data on workflow and past practices to put together scheduling algorithms, predicting when workers will be needed, to assign tasks to workers on a rolling basis without managerial involvement, and to set wages by discerning the market price for labor at scale, uh, and even to closely surveil workers who are nominally not even part of their enterprise. Uh, I discuss a lot of those issues in chapter three and chapters, chapter five of the book. Companies can also use similar techniques to prevent workers from building collective power. So for example, they can aggregate data from multiple sources to make predictions about which job applicants are most likely to support unionization uh, and often to refuse to hire them. That may be illegal, but it's very difficult to detect. They can use data to spot nascent unionization campaigns and to snuff them out or to reorganize production in ways that isolate workers from one another and make it much harder for them to build the kinds of social bonds that are necessary for concerted action. Uh, I talk about that in a, another chapter of the book, chapter four. Finally, uh, companies can leverage data and AI both to grow rapidly into uh, you know, very large scale continent wide companies, even as they push a lot of workers outside their corporate boundaries uh, and, and yet supervise them. So in other words, new data practices are implicated in two major changes in industrial organization that we've seen over the last 10, 20 years, consolidation on the one hand and the fissuring of employment on the other. These developments are also leading to concentrated information about production, which companies can very often gather internally and in case using either contractual means or intellectual property rights rendering it profitable by preventing others from accessing it or using it. A nice go-to example here is Uber's matching algorithm. Another would be Amazon's, you know, the, the algorithms Amazon uses to optimize their delivery systems. Workers end up with far less discretion and, place for, and space for creativity here and are atomized from one another, even as they're subject to collect to centralized management. And part of, you know, the, the book in the empirical sections traces out these dynamics in most large low wage sectors today, including retail, fast food, hospitality, logistics, and some healthcare sectors. So in other words, companies are using data on the one hand to protect themselves against market discipline, even as they use data to subject workers to intensive market discipline. Um, and so I argue that data-driven technologies are an important source of class power today, an important site in which classes, class power is being exercised and to some extent uh, class is being reproduced. That leads into my second goal here, uh, and I recognize I'm, sh I'm short on time, uh, but which is to restate that to, to develop an account of the relationship among technology, class relations and law that draws from legal realism and institutionalist social science. So a starting point here is that companies can use technology for two quite different purposes, uh, to enhance productivity, making more with less, and to exert power over workers. And some of the use cases I've already talked about do both of those. And there are many you know, examples of both throughout history. Development of the factory system, Fordism, post-war automation, Amazon's reorganization of its warehouses, all of those combine productivity enhancement with power augmentation at the shop floor level. However, um, for the past few decades, it has simply become much more difficult to maintain compounding productivity growth due to secular changes in the global economy, including global industrial saturation, uh, the rise of a service-based economy in the wealthy nations, and in general, the secular decline of technological rents. This is part of the background story to the resurgence of uh, inequality and kind of overt capital labor conflict starting in the 1980s. And the development of data-driven technologies is one among a few uh, efforts through which, means through which companies have tried to maintain profitability in wealthy economies that are dominated by services today. So uh, across the economy, service economies that employ large amounts of labor have use data to reduce labor share in many of the ways that I talked about a moment ago. Law plays a central role in the story, though I also think a circumscribed role. 
Uh, but in brief, the, the allocation of rights in data and in workplace technology on the one hand, and the law's allocation of rights of concerted action on the other, end up strongly shaping companies' incentives around technology. Where workers are demobilized and companies have capacious rights over workplace data and tech, companies have greater incentives to focus on power augmenting strategies. This is my argument. Conversely, where workers are well organized and able to block capital's efforts to reduce labor share, companies are more likely to invest in productivity enhancements. And a lot of the changes we have seen in labor and employment law over the last two generations have actually in that light facilitated the development of workplace AI and pushed it in power augmenting directions. I'll say just a word about this and then wrap up. So since the 1980s, we've kind of recast the employment relationship as a contract between equals rather than a social relationship jointly constituted by unions and management. Also during that time, companies claimed very broad rights in workplace technology and data in part by resisting claims for workplace privacy. Uh, at the same time, companies claimed broad rights in, uh, in uh, products derived from that data through expansive IP doctrines. So as I said, as a, a moment ago, alongside those government sh governance shifts, we've seen a long-term trend toward power augmenting uses of technology. And I think that correlation is no accident. The law evolved under pressure from companies to facilitate new data extraction and usage strategies. Okay, that's the core of the book. I have some thoughts on possible policy responses, which I can talk about in Q and A, but let me stop there. Uh, and I really look forward to your questions and comments. Thanks again. Okay, so Valerio now has the floor. He has the, um, the awesome job of uh, commenting on three different books. Uh, take it away, Valerio. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you for, for having me. Uh, it's and do a, speak up. Yes, it is a great pleasure to, to be here to, to comment your books, uh, to, to see Wilma. Um, it, I have to say that these are three wonderful books and I really can't wait for them to be out in, uh, in the press. I think we are in for a threat um, because it, it is uh, true that the, 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 the area of work and technology is overcrowded, but these books really stand up in this very crowded area, in my opinion. And they also provide a very good map of what are the most pressing issues in this field. And um, of course, you have already heard that they are not about the extremely high uh, gig economy debate. We have uh, more than enough of that, of course, but they go much beyond that. Uh, and I think, again, they, have, they really are to be welcomed. Uh, I think there are, there are some common traits and, of course, differences uh, among the books. Uh, one of the biggest common traits is that uh, none of the book is a book from a prophet of doom, okay? And no one is against technology per se. So there is no risk of ludism. And again, Ifeoma has a wonderful discussion in the book about what ludism actually was and is. And so again, ludism is, a, is another um, hyped term that, uh, that it's mostly uh, misused, but this is nothing about ludism. But at the same time, I want to be clear on that. These are not techno-deterministic books either. So, they all see that technology can provide opportunities, but for do so, to do so, and sorry for my English, um, to do so, you need to govern the process in which technology is used in society, and in particular is used in the area of work. You cannot leave technology at work in the hands of a few CEOs in the Silicon Valley. I think this is something that stands out very clearly from all of the books. Now, uh, if I start with uh, going in order with uh, seeing this book, I think uh, what she does, and, and it's true that um, her book is a bit different from, from the other two because it focuses on the quantity of jobs, on the risk of automation. And I completely agree that it's something that lawyers have not focused enough on. And her book has the uh, very good, um, 
um, feature of doing so and, and actually so, so very brilliantly. Um, Cindy examines some of the policies that have been put forward in recent years to govern these automation risks, uh, in particular uh, universal basic income, the federal job guarantee, and reduction of working times. And she answered very clearly to all of these three policies with alternatives. So she doesn't go for any of those just like they are. But in my opinion, she advances what in Europe we will call a social democratic, if you want, agenda. I think, I hope that's not a bad word in the US. Um, it, but it is really a social democratic agenda to the couple, uh, for instance, health um, benefits from the employment relationship. Of course, uh, for a European, that is something that we can't even imagine to have your affiliation to the national health service, depending on, or, or the fact that you don't have a national health service, uh, but that depending on employment. Uh, or she also speak about reduction of working hours. And of course, in Europe, we have, uh, working hours regulation that regard more or less everyone in the labor market that set the top tire, uh, the managers and directors, uh, which are, I think, stricter than in the US. And also the question of, uh, in my opinion, uh, what we would call here unemployment benefits more at large. Now, the, the issue I see from my standpoint, from the standpoint of a European, is that uh, we do have many of these things in Europe, but at the same time, we are affected by technology and we, are, uh, we, we run the same risks here that you run in, in the United States. Uh, but one of the things I think that the, the book has spurred me to think about uh, is to consider very closely the idea of the UBI that uh, Cindy doesn't buy but to reread this idea of extended universal income support uh, coming from existing systems of unemployment benefits and reducing conditionalities, reducing w uh, the workfare approach to those systems. And I think in, during the pandemic, we have seen actually something going in this direction. So it's not something that is completely uh, on the moon, actually. We can do something like that. And I think it's gonna be something necessary to disrupt, in a way, the labor market from, if you want, uh, the worker side, to disrupt uh, labor supply by providing people uh, with uh, more bargaining power in terms of uh, income alternatives. And I think this is something that we have to examine in the future. Of course, I don't see this as an alternative of, um, to protection on the jobs. This is very important. Uh, I'm not advocating for a um, flex security approach that it's something that um, nobody's doing anymore. Nobody is advocating for, not even in Europe anymore. Uh, you need to be protected in the workplace. You also need to be protected in the labor market and those two are not true alternative sets of policies. Now, coming to Ifeoma's book, uh, again, also from this book and from uh, Brishan's book, uh, you see that something is profoundly changing in our labor market. So this time is actually gonna be different. Uh, Ifeoma has a wonderful discussion on uh, the idea of quantified workers, that it's, it's nothing new. Uh, it goes back to Roman law, it's, it goes back to Roman times, and even to Greek times, one could argue. Uh, and she has a wonderful historical discussion of how, of how we got here, uh, the discussion on uh, Taylorism, the discussion on Fordism, and how now technologies allow for this wider and much more profound uh, quantification of work and workers. Uh, and this time, in my opinion, it is truly different because contrary to what happened in the past, technology allows to follow workers second by second uh, and to an extent that was completely inconceivable uh, only a few decades ago, to the extent that now employers are uh, after brain data, emotional data, the data on mental states, 
on top of controlling physical movements, on top of controlling uh, bathroom breaks and all these kind of things. Uh, now, in my opinion, that doesn't bring us anywhere better than we are now. We don't need that to enhance productivity. And there are so many shortcomings and uh, basically risks that come out of these practices. And if Eoma discusses some of them very thoroughly, and I think this is also something that you find in Brishan's book. And if we look at, uh, at a Brishan book, one thing that I really appreciated is also the focus on the collective side. Uh, what uh, we would call, you would call labor laws uh, as opposed to employment laws. We don't have that, that discussion, uh, that di differentiation so, so uh, clear here in Europe, but that's what Richard's book is also about, how to reconstruct uh, the collective bargaining power of workers in this new society, in this new uh, production reality. And it comes with very important suggestion, policy suggestion on, uh, on, on that side that I really appreciate it. Because one of the things, and I think, again, from all these books, we see finally scholars really engaging with the important things in the, the field of technology and work much more than the employment status of gig workers, which is also important, but there are much more important things. And uh, a, an attention to the collective side of these processes and how to govern them from the collective side is extremely welcome. Now, I, I want to conclude because I wanna leave enough space to, uh, to, the, to the Q and A with two uh, really uh, final observation. The first one, uh, if we are talking about the way technology is affecting our workplaces and also the individual quality of work, I am afraid that privacy is not enough. Okay, the risks that this, um, on top of employment and automation, and, and what Cindy says in her book is extremely important, but on top of that, we cannot just concentrate on privacy. This processes also are a threat in terms of discrimination, are a threat in terms of enhanced uh, occupational health and safety risks, psychosocial risk for uh, extreme monitoring and continuous monitoring. Um, there are risks for uh, collective rights. Grishan uh, spoke in his presentation about using a technology to uh, disrupt uh, unionizing, disrupt uh, labor movements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is not just about privacy. Privacy is an important part, but it's not just about that. And finally, I am also of the idea that we need to rediscuss what you call managerial prerogatives, and what in Italy we would call the powers of the employer. Managerial prerogatives that were conceived at the end of the uh, 18th century are not the same now. Technology puts those powers and prerogatives on steroids. We should call these powers into question if we want to have protection of Republican rights in, uh, in, in the workplace. I mean, one of the things that um, I learned when I first studied labor law is that the constitution doesn't stop at the uh, gates of the factory. And this is extremely important uh, because to protect civil liberties at the moment, you need to do that also at the workplace. And you need also to be brave enough to say, you know what, some of the application of this technology should be outright banned. We banned polygraphs 20 years ago. There is no reason why we shouldn't ban emotional surveillance at the workplace nowadays. And with that, I conclude. Thank you very much for having me. That was fantastic, Valerio. And uh, well within your time limits, leaving us with some time to comment. I just want to um, uh, open it up by pointing out there's, there's a nice synergy among all three books and Valerio's comments along um, the lines that he closed with. If we find ways both collectively and um, through legislation to push back on the unproductive power enhancing uses of technology that are attracting the greatest concern, um, uh, we can you know, uh, push in the direction of 
uh, productivity enhancements that can potentially benefit everyone if we have the right political economy and the right policies in place to spread the benefits. Um, so uh, does anyone um, want to uh, respond, Ifeoma? Yes, uh, so thank you so much, uh, Valerio, for that um, outstanding, um, I, I don't even know what to call it, treatise of our, of our three books and uh, just capturing, um, you know, the, the mood and, and the themes and also raising important questions um, as to what the focus should be for scholarship and also for legal regulation. Um, I guess I wanted to respond to your last provocation about whether privacy is enough or really your, your provocation that it isn't enough um, and to say that I completely agree. Um, in fact, I, did, I, I devote several chapters of my book um, to this idea that um, automated technologies in the workplace are not merely about you know, wearable tech, which is you know, um, eroding privacy because of the minute surveillance, but also about technologies that can be used to better, uh, uh, basically to, to, to better enact discrimination, unlawful discrimination, and to better evade um, legal regulation of unlawful regulation, uh, of unlawful discrimination. Um, so by that, I mean uh, technologies like automated uh, hiring systems, um, which may use proxies in, uh, that essentially would uh, work the same as the protected categories under anti-discrimination laws, and thereby could then evade uh, both detection and also regulation. Um, I also uh, think, think about um, workplace wellness programs, um, which also can enact discrimination against, uh, you know, differently able people or people with genetic diseases um, while still masquerading and in fact, enjoying the protection of the law, right, as a public health measure. Um, so, you know, many people don't know, but um, workplace wellness programs enjoy the support of the ACA. Um, there's an explicit provision under the Affordable Care Act for workplace wellness programs which also helps um, somewhat exempt them from existing law, such as the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, so I, I definitely take your, your comment um, well, which is that you know, privacy is merely the tip of the iceberg and may not frankly be the most important concern here, rather it is this discrimination against certain categories of workers and the potential to create essentially an underclass of workers, right? Um, who could be permanently excluded from the workplace with the use of these emerging technologies. So yeah, thank you for that. Christian, I thought you might wanna get into the discussion. Um, so first off, Valeria, thank you so much for your uh, for your comments and for the, the the close read of the drafts that we sent you. Um, I have uh, just maybe two or three things to say. One in response to Valeria's comments, and then one or two in response to what's actually in the the, the chat already on privacy. So there's an interesting. Um, a bit of a shift that's maybe starting to happen in the way at least some privacy law scholars think about this set of questions. Um, where for a long time we, you know, I think the dominant understanding of privacy within the law, but then also to an extent within privacy law theorists was that it was an individual right, it protected individuals in important ways. Um, and there are very good reasons for that. Privacy claims are, for the most part, individualized claims under tort doctrine, under statutory rights, et cetera. And privacy harms involve you know, things that happen to individuals. But one of the interesting trends that I build on in the book, and I, I don't know if I gave you the chapters, um, is to understand uh, new data-driven technologies as operating at a population-wide level in ways that can't really be reduced to questions of individualized privacy. So data harvesting can lead to predictions about worker behavior uh, or about market performance um, in ways that don't exactly trigger classical dignitary concerns. And that's one of the separations from classical conceptions of privacy. But then as importantly, it simply doesn't even make sense to conceptualize that as an individualized harm because the harm to the extent it happens, happens to a group of people. 
Now, I, I, Salome uh, Viljoen, who is going to be a Columbia Fellow in law next year, has written a fantastic article or two on this that I'd I'd, I'd recommend to people. I, you know, I, and and I, I I think that this is just an area because we're seeing developments on the ground that you know we're going to be trying to unpack and theorize for a while. But I did want to point out that sort of broader conception of privacy rights that seems to be emerging. Um, very quickly in response to one of the questions in the chat, and then I'll come back to another one. Uh, Maya asked about the expansive IP doctrines. Um, you know, there's kind of a long-term, though well, there is a long-term trend toward intellectual property rights uh, being both uh, more expansive geographically and lasting longer over periods of time. Um, and there's also a trend toward companies claiming it, in IP rights and you know sort of quasi IP rights and workers own cognitive property. Orly Lobel has a very good paper on this, um, but you see it in a number of areas. Uh, covenants not to compete are one. Um, you know non poaching agreements are another. But part of the process that I'm trying to get at, and, and Ifioma I think is as well, is that once data is extracted from workers, once knowledge is extracted from workers, that can end up being protected by copyright, by patents, um, and probably most importantly by trade secrets doctrine um, in ways that prevents others from accessing it. And so in that way, knowledge is really being extracted from workers and then turned into you know, company property in new ways. It's again, a process that we're just, I think, starting to get a good map of um, kind of socio-legally. And so we'll continue figuring it out. Um, Maya, to your question on policy responses, I, I don't have good ones on that front, unfortunately, um, but I, I'll see if I can for the final draft of the book. Let me jump in and um, raise something. I think we all in different ways have had to think about the politics of getting from point A to point B, regardless of what we think point B looks like. Um, and that makes me, uh, that connects in my mind with the discussion about privacy. The thing about privacy is um, it's not, doesn't accurately and completely describe the problem, but politically it's uh, a relatively, uh, uh, it's a much less polarizing uh, way to uh, approach the problem. And, and more generally, um, I, I think I would argue that um, anything that can be framed and achieved through changes in employment law, what we call employment law, as opposed to labor law, we're going to have it, it, it may be limited in how much you can accomplish without directly changing the collective uh, labor relations system. But um, there are so many more openings at state and local levels and um, so much less polarization than there is. And, and Brishan actually impressed this point upon me with regard to my own book that you know many of the proposals that I'm talking about can potentially be um, achieved at a, a, a low or less polarized level of, of politics. And so I just wonder whether uh, you all have thought about that uh, dimension of the problem as well. If you have, do you have thoughts? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have some thoughts. I was waiting on you all. Oh, um, so yeah, so, so I do have some thoughts about this. Um, you know, I, I think like you said, privacy is definitely a more accessible path because it is one that I think generally, despite you know political persuasion, most people have a, a, a visceral sort of um, relationship to right the idea that you know I get to keep some of my personhood by keeping some of my information private. Um, you know that being said, in terms of like um, solutions at other levels beyond you know a more expansive overhauling of like employment or labor law. Um, I, I, in my papers have talked about um, collective bargaining um, as one level. Um, so not getting into big scale union issues, but more thinking about if you do have a union, right? How can your union perhaps um, work to protect employee privacy? So just sort of um, the union taking the role of like bargaining, like, you know, here's the data that can be collected. Um, here's what that data can be used for. 
also bargaining for things like the data should be deleted after a certain point, or you know, the employee should have access to the data and be able to correct mistakes. So that's something I explored. Um, uh, I explore in a forthcoming article um, the auditing imperative for um, automated hiring systems. So in that one, I'm really focused squarely on automated hiring systems um, as one way. Um, of course, there's an issue there in terms of like, you know, when you're getting hired, you're not necessarily uh, a union a union uh, a union member yet. Um, but I do still feel that unions can have a role there because obviously these are potential uh, members for them. So being able to say we've negotiated this better privacy options for you, um, I think can be helpful. Um, other, other things I've seen on a more local level are actually states um, who are, um, I guess, uh, setting in place uh, parameters of like uh, privacy protections for workers. So California is a leader in this. Um, the other states are following suit like uh, New Jersey, uh, a few others in terms of like social media tracking of employees. Um, so obviously that's not changing the law whole scale, but still um, allowing for some meaningful um, sort of changes for workers in those states. Um, I think generally, I do think we will need an overhaul. Um, I think it will not be enough to have these smaller local or um, sector by sector or industry by industry changes. I think eventually we'll, we will need an overhaul of the labor and employment law uh, regimes. And I think, um, uh, I think actually Valerio uh, touched on this in his um, uh, comments also, which is this employer uh, prerogative. Um, so I think in America, uh, that's what we have. We have an employer prerogative. And I discuss this in my paper, The Paradox of Automation as Anti-Bias Intervention, which is that in American law, there is this traditional deference to the employer. And other authors have also noted this. So you said something like the constitution doesn't end at the factory gates, Valeria. In America, it does actually. <laughs> so I, I kind of smile when you say that. Um, because uh, you know, pe people like Elizabeth Arden writing about private government, by which she actually means the workplace. Well, uh, the private, um, Elizabeth Anderson. Elizabeth Anderson, sorry, um, writing about private government, right? So the idea that the workplace actually operates as a private government where um, constitutional protections um, that you might have for public sector employees, you don't have for private sector employees. So. Looks like you're gonna get the last word, Rishin. <laughs> Okay, two minutes. Um, Cindy, I think there's tons that uh, states can do here, um, you know, within the scope of NLRA preemption. Um, so, you know, one option is uh, direct regulation of the employer-employee relationship and resetting the privacy rules that govern the employer-employee relationship. Um, most of the action there has been at the state level uh, over the last, you know, 40 years, probably forever, and will continue to be. And of course, a lot of the backdrop is just common law regulation of employment, which is a state prerogative. Um, second, uh, you know, notwithstanding our conversation at the plenary, you know, I, I think there's a lot of space for sectoral bargaining initiatives at the state level that would, you know, create set wages, set other terms and conditions at the sectoral level, and create mechanisms for worker involvement uh, in that, not as a way of displacing uh, enterprise bargaining at all, but rather as a way for states to, you know, prevent uh, ruinous competition within particular industries, set a floor below wages and practices. Um, the place that connects up to the overall story in my book is basically that it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a factor substitution argument at the end of the day. Um, if we protect workers, um, if we set a higher wage floor, if we make it harder to engage in things like uh, schedule, ju just in time scheduling of workers, if we make it harder to misclassify workers, all the stuff that you know, we labor lawyers have been talking about for a while, 
that should create incentives for companies to invest more in productivity enhancement. I actually think that the we're not getting back to the post-war levels of productivity growth that we once had, and that has real implications for what we want to do about work that you take up, obviously, in your book. Um, however, sort of cutting off that low road can actually push employers uh, and slash companies, you know, more onto a high road. So um, that pretty much takes us to our time. I would be happy to hang around for a couple of minutes, but I, before doing that, I want to very much thank all the panelists, but especially Valerio for uh, coming in and giving us a really fantastic overview of um, uh, the, the specifics and the generalities. So thank you so much. We'll look forward to seeing much more of you once you're a North American. Um, and thanks to Lyra for um, hosting this. Uh, so our, our session is officially over, um, but I think, you know, we can hang out for a few minutes in this room if we want. Um, so thanks, everybody. So uh, Valerio, that was spectacular. I am so um, glad that we uh, got you to come in and do this. Thank you so it much. It really was. Thank you. No, no, it was it was really my pleasure, and really, I can't wait for the for the books to be to be out. Yeah. And and neither can we. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, mine's yeah. coming out by the end of the, by, by the end of July. Oh wow! Supposedly. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's super soon. Okay. Good. I was thinking of turning things over to you in the end if we'd had more time, Valerio, to, because some of what people have been talking about is sort of standard fare in. Europe, um, both through European um, legislation and um, collective action, Works Council uh, legislation and Works Council involvement. Um, a lot of, I think, what Brishin would talk, would, would want, and, and Ifioma as well, um, that's exactly what Works Councils enable workers to do when they have um, an organizational form through which to do it. Although, as was pointed out by Damon Silvers in the plenary on the ground, it looks like those works councils don't um, work all that well where there isn't uh, an actively involved um, uh, union on the scene. Mm. Well, uh, they certainly are always better than nothing. Yeah. Uh, also because they uh, foster this culture of dialogue between management and workers. That, so basically, uh, you create a community, uh, which is something that I don't think it's so much there in traditional workplaces in the mm -hmm. United States. Right. So that's one uh, good aspect. And one thing that is very important is that works council, so you don't need very complex validation processes like the one that you get under the right. NLRA, uh, NLRA, yes? Yes. Uh, in the United States, uh, so that complicate the things of unionizing. Then of course, you don't get necessarily um, necessary bargaining power as you get in the US. So you might have to basically trade something if you want mm. that kind of model, mm -hmm. um, but in terms, and I think this is important both for your discourse, Cindy, and the rest, uh, collective uh, works council or trade unions, it depends, they are heavily involved also in uh, the management of redundancies, of collective redundancies. And one of the ways in which Germany in particular, but also the Nordic countries, heavily mitigated the financial crisis was through collective agreements that basically were mandated by national or European mm -hmm. legislation yeah. on collective rights and collective involvement. Mm. So there is also that it's not just about day by day management, but it's also to mitigate and minimize uh, restructuring. Yeah. And, uh, it is not that you stop them, but you put forward some uh, uh, protection for people that are involved by those things. And of course, if you have the, the question of data government, uh, governance, also for a European, the first step is empowering the World's Council to veto or to uh, process some of the uh, tech innovation at the workplace, which is yeah. something they traditionally done. Yeah. 
So now I feel that we probably do actually have to vacate our room because the next panel is trying to get their act together. Um, but it was wonderful to see you all. And I hope to see you all at LLRN. Yes. I'll say one thing quickly, Peter, thank you again for your question. Feel free to email me. It's one I'm kind of working okay. through a bit and would love to we'll talk do. about. Yeah, I'm thinking yeah. particularly about uh, retail where uh, yeah. there has been a lot of productivity growth, but it's not clear that's um, driven by investments and labor. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Good all to right. see you Thanks, all. Everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.
Hi, folks. Hey, Lance, how are you doing? Good. Nice to see everybody. Yeah. Right back. So, hi, Kate. Hi, Mary Joyce. You're muted. Hi. I got, I'm, I'm okay. I'm unmuted. I'm un <laughs> on video. I'm, I'm good to go. Yay. <laughs> Well, thank you for making it. I know you're one of the busiest people who will be in the room today. So um, uh, it's great to see you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for all the work you did on this. Well, we're, we are so uh, still in the weeds and um, Kate has made a lot of more progress than we have, but we are slowly digging through our data and we're just at the beginning of, uh, you know, getting some findings. So, um, but I have Ken and uh, Tosh are finally freed up. Ken finishes dissertation. Tosh is uh, Professor back at Cornell. And so they're like going gangbusters now and I don't have to worry about the data. <laughs> well, that's good. And Kate, that law review article you wrote was terrific. Oh, good. I'm glad you got a chance to, to look at it and would love to talk to you offline sometime about your thoughts. Yeah, yeah I'd really, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to figure out what we can do to get some of that, I guess, probably our lab, the, it'd be too much to hope for to think that we could get the judiciary to adopt some of that thinking, but maybe the DOL, I don't know. Right, exactly. Enforcement agencies would be the first, right. Yeah. But it was great that you gave the fight for 15 so much attention in that. I mean, really, when you think about it, without the fight for 15, who would know about any of this? Right, right, exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah, well, that's my first point when I introduced this, is that it was all due to the fight for 15 that, that uh, and you, uh, your inspiration, and Wilma, that we... Uh, we have gone down this path and it's been, um, and there's still a lot to learn, so, yeah. Rose, did you already start recording or is that left over from the previous session? I believe that's left over. 